In this lesson, we talk about manipulating property data using methods. The objectives for this lesson are to explore different types of methods, learn to return values from methods, we're going to create a constructor, we're going to use a constant. We'll talk about parameters and arguments, overloading, optional parameters, and named parameters, and see different ways to pass parameters to methods. So why should we use methods? Well, it helps break our program into just smaller chunks. And this aids in readability, makes things easier to debug, easier to read and follow the logic of the code. Hopefully it's going to reduce our bugs as well. There are different types of methods. A method can return a value or not, and you can pass parameters in or not. When naming a method, methods should be a verb or a verb phrase. It's something that suggests an action that can happen. For example, get products, insert, update, delete, things like that are good examples of method names. Methods should always begin with a letter or an underscore. Again, I would lean more towards just doing it with a letter. Don't do an underscore. After that, that method name can contain letters, numbers, and underscores and it can be up to 255 characters long. Let's create a void method now within our product class. Open the product class and put back the profit to be the full property declaration, but as a read-only property. Then let's create a private void method called calculate profit. And inside of here, we're going to write that same code that we had before, where it was the profit is equal to list price minus standard cost. Now, if you remember, what we did before is we had this line of code here in this set. I'm going to replace that with calculate profit. And we also had it here in this set as well. Obviously, it's much better to break these out into a method. That way, if you need to change the algorithm, you only have to change it in one place. All right, if we were to then look at our program, we should still see that we're going to grab the profit here, and it should still report everything back just like normal. Let's now create a method in our product class to return a value. Go back to the product class and let's add a couple other properties. So I'm going to use our prop snippet and I'm going to create a date time called cell start date. And I'll create another date time, which is the cell end date. So these are the two dates in which I wish to sell a product. Then let's add a public int get number of cell days. So this method is going to return the number of days that is the result of the end date minus the start date. So we use the return statement. We do the cell end date minus the cell start date. And then we grab the days property. So there we have our number of cell days. So whenever you have a void method, one that does not return anything, we put the void keyword and we don't use a return statement. When you put a data type in front of the method name, that means you're going to return something and you do need to use the return statement. Let's now go over to the program.cs. What we're going to do is add in here where we initialize it with the cell start date of 10-1-2022 and the cell end date of 12-31-2022. We can add then a console.writeline and we will call the get number of cell days, like so. And let's just go ahead and put in a string in front of this, days to cell, like so. Go ahead and run this, and we should see that there are 91 days in which we can sell this product. When you create properties in a class, they all have their default value based on their data type. One thing you might want to do is add a constructor to the class, and that's where you can then initialize the properties to a valid start value. So for example, in this code here, I've got my public class product. If you add a public and then the actual class name, but it looks like a method, 
open close parenthesis. Then you write however much code you want in there to initialize any of the properties. Let's take a look at building a constructor. In the product class, create another string variable called color. Then we're going to create a constructor. And I like putting my constructors immediately after my class definition. Again, that's all style. Choose whatever you like to do. But you can see on line four, public product, open, close parenthesis. That means that that is a constructor. It doesn't have void. It doesn't have a return value. It just means I am the same name as that class. So that's what is the first method that's going to be called when you instantiate the object. Then on lines five through eight, I can go ahead and initialize certain properties to whatever start value I wish to have. We then can go to our program.cs and we can modify this declaration a little bit now because if we eliminate the ones that are already being set, for example, if we just do that, that would be really easy because all the other ones are set, but let's leave the cell end date in there. And let's go ahead now and right after the entity name, let's add the color. Just so we have everything there. So now we've simplified our initialization because a lot of the values are already going to be initialized for us. Now, it doesn't mean that we want those values to be that all the time and you can still set them, but it is one way that you can do things. If we then run, you can now see that the color is black. You see the standard cost is $1. The list price is $5. And now the number of days to sell is 32 because of the date and time that I'm recording this particular lesson. Instead of hard coding values, I like using constants. So I might create a literal string or a literal number. For here, what I'm going to do is do a default underscore color and assign it equal to black. And then I'm going to modify the constructor just to use that constant instead of hard coding all the values. And I could do the same thing for the standard cost, the list price, anything that is a literal value I can use. So let's take a look at just adding a constant to the class. Open the product class and add your private constant, as you can see here on line 11. Then go up here to the constructor, and then we can use that constant. Now, nothing else has changed, so we're going to get the exact same samples. But again, I like having things that are not going to be hard coded as much. And again, I might want to do the same thing for standard cost and list price. I might create other constants here. But again, just wanted to kind of point that out. Now to our methods, we can also pass values. So like on council.writeline, we can either just pass nothing, or we can do a council.writeline with some value being passed. So we can pass in an argument or not. It's up to whoever designed the method. Now an argument is something you pass to a method. A method can accept 0, 1, or many parameters. So parameters and arguments. Now parameter is the declaration of the variable in the method signature. An argument is the value that's passed to the method. Now parameter and argument are often used interchangeably. It really doesn't matter, but just know that there is a slight technical difference in what they are called. That's all. I've used the term method signature a couple of times, and what that is, it's the name of the method plus any parameters. The return type is not included. So here's an example of the calculate profit method that we wrote earlier, and then a second version of that calculate profit to which I pass in two variables, decimal price and decimal cost. So the signature is the method name and any parameters. Now, this is actually an example of method overloading as well, where we're using the same method name, but different number of parameters. So whenever you see the same method name, but a different number of parameters, that is called overloading a method. Now, overloading can also be the same number of parameters as long as one of the data types is different. And a good example would be the council object that we've been using. We have a council.write line, and it'll take strings, integers, decimals, whatever. 
So this is a great example of many overloads of the same method, and it just varies by the data type, not the number of parameters. All right, let's take a look at passing arguments to a method. In our product class, I'm going to come down here to the bottom again, and I'm going to add a new method that you see here on lines 59 through 61. Public decimal, calculate profit, and I'm passing in two parameters, decimal price and decimal cost. All I'm going to do is simply return price minus cost. So to call that, well, let's go back to our program dot cs and we'll write just a little bit of code here where what we're going to do is a council dot write line entity dot calculate profit now we're passing two values to the calculate profit so these arguments are being passed to those parameters that we defined in the calculate profit signature line and then of course i'm going to do a two string on that to do it as a currency so if we run this, we can see that we now get the $16.63. That is the result of taking 30.99 minus 14.36. Let's now take a look at optional parameters. Now, instead of overloading a method, you can also use optional parameters. This is where you assign a default to the parameter to make it optional. Let's take a look at optional parameters. In the product class, locate the calculate profit that passes in the two variables and add on equals one to the second parameter. What that does is it says, I'm now an optional parameter. If you don't pass anything to cost, it will automatically assign it the value of one. So we go back to program.cs. Let's copy this line, but take out the second parameter. Notice it now still works. If we run this, you can now see that what it's doing is it is saying, well, I've got this $30.99 and I'm subtracting the cost of $1, so my net profit is now $29.99. Another way to do an optional parameter is you could add on the question mark to make it a nullable value. You still want to leave the equals one. And the reason you might want to do this because you might wish to test to see, did they pass in a cost? Because if just assigned to one, you don't know whether they passed in a one or was it one because of the default. This way you could actually do an if statement if you wanted and say if cost dot has value, then you know that you can assign it to something. Of course, a very simple way to do this would simply to be used the null coalescing operator, and then just say cost. If that's not null, then return a one. If we were to run this, we'll still get the exact same value we did before. Let's now take a look at named parameter. This is where you can call out the name of the parameter when passing your arguments to a method. It allows you to put arguments in any order. You do not have to match the parameter order. And the reason you might want to do this is it actually makes reading the code easier because when you're looking at the call, you don't necessarily have to go down to the method to look at the signature to figure out positionally what's being passed. You can actually see the parameter name. Let's take a look at an optional parameter scenario. In the product class, I put the calculate profit method back to the way it was before, no optional parameters. Let's go back to the program.cs because what we can do now is I'm going to type in cost colon comma profit or excuse me price colon and then I'll use the same values we had before but now I've done them out of order. But because I'm specifying the name of the parameter it maps each value to the correct parameter. If we run this we still get the exact value that we saw before. You're also allowed to pass arguments to a constructor as well, as long as that constructor has parameters to receive those. Let's take a look. Open the product class again, and let's add a new constructor. So you can see on line 11, public product, and now within the parentheses is where I define 
two parameters coming in, an int ID and a string name. I'm then going to use each of those variables to assign it to the product ID and the name respectively. And then I'm going to go ahead and initialize all the other code just like I did in the other constructor. But now if we go back to the program.cs, what I can do here is I can actually pass in to this constructor two values. So in this case, I'm going to say product entity equals new and then two that lines up with the product ID and then bicycle. So now what I want to do is I want to eliminate the product ID and the name because those are now being set via the constructor. So let's go ahead and run this and there we can see two dash bicycle. It's being set through that constructor now. The problem with the code I just wrote is there is duplicate code now in each of the constructors. Let's refactor both of those and extract that code out. Add a new method called init. And in this init method, we're going to grab the code that we had in one of those constructors, like so, and it will take it out completely out of the other one because it's the same exact code. We'll then call the init method from this one and we'll call the init method from this one. So now each of the constructors simply call a refactored method. Let's talk about how these parameters are passed. There's two different ways. It's call by value and call by reference. Now call by value means that it is the default passing mode, but it means that you're copying the argument value and passing it to the method and it's received then into that parameter. But if you, any changes that you make within that method in the, to the parameter, they're not reflected in the argument that got passed down. So let's do a demonstration of this so you can see what this looks like. Let's create a new method here, calculate profit by value. We'll pass in the decimal price and the decimal cost. So it looks very much like what we had written before, but look what I'm doing now on lines 75 and 76. I'm actually changing the parameter price and changing the parameter cost. Then I return the price minus the cost. So obviously it's going to be 15 that comes back from this. Right? Let's take a look at how this works though. What I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of wipe out all of this. Let's kind of get back to scratch here. So I've now created an instance of product called it entity. Decimal price is equal to 30.99 and decimal cost is equal to 14.36. I then call the entity dot calculate profit by val passing in the price and the cost. Remember what that's going to return. It'll be a 15. But remember, I actually changed price and cost within that method. So what are the values going to come out when we print them out on lines 10 and 11? Let's run this. So you see that we have the 15, which is being returned back, but 30.99 and 14.36, that's exactly what they were before they got passed in. So changing the parameters inside of the method do not change the values of the arguments that are passed in. That is pass by value. So what does it mean to call by reference? Well, you're going to specify the ref keyword in the parameter list. You'll specify the ref keyword when passing the argument that means that the address of where the variable is located in memory is passed to that method. So changes to that parameter actually change the variable that is coming in. All right, so let's take a look at call by reference. Open up the product class, add a new method called calculate profit by ref. You now see the ref keyword in front of each of the parameters coming into this method. I then do the same exact code, price equals 20, cost equals five, return price minus cost. But the problem is now if I do the calculate by ref here and I add the ref keyword in front and that gives you the clue right there of what's going on. I like how they did this. If you're using ref as a parameter, you must do the ref on the argument because this tells us exactly what's going to happen. We are changing these values now. So now when we run this, we get 
15 for the calculation of the profit, but you can see that now price and cost declared here on lines 5 and 6 have indeed been changed to 20 and 5. Now I'm going to recommend you don't do this too much. You don't want to use this very often. You shouldn't have to use this very often. It makes things a little bit harder to debug. So try to use this very sparingly. The last kind of parameter we're going to take a look at is an output parameter. Now as you know, a method can only return a single value, but an out parameter placed on that method can also return another value. We use the keyword out on both the parameter and the argument. Now the method may or may not return a value. That's perfectly fine. If you want to have a return a value or not, it's fine, but you're allowed then one or many parameters marked with the out. So why output parameters? Well, ref parameters, you really don't know if they're going to be changed or not because you know that it could possibly change it, but you don't really know. With an out parameter, you always know they are returning something. So let's take a look at output parameters. Open the product class and add a public void trial increase by percentage. We're going to pass in a percentage value, and then we're going to get back the price and the cost. They're going to come back as output variables. So you have to initialize the parameters to something. So I'm going to initialize the price to the list price property and the cost to the standard cost. Then I'm going to go ahead and set these by price times equals percent, cost times equal percent. And what's going to happen is it's going to change price and cost to the outside whoever calls this particular method. So let's go ahead and redo things again here. Line three, I create a new instance of the product class and I set the standard cost to 10 and the list price to 100. Notice I have to have two separate variables here on lines eight and nine. If I'm gonna pass something in as an output parameter, I need to have variables to do that. I can't just pass a literal here. So I'm gonna set decimal price equals zero, decimal cost equals zero. So right now there's zero. I'm then gonna say, Entity dot trial increase by percentage passing in 1.1 comma out price out cost. So that again is a clue to me that this routine, whatever it does, is going to be changing price and cost. And now I can spit out price and cost. So if we run this, we can see we get the value 110 and 11 because we're basically increasing it by 10%. So we have changed those values, but we're using the out to do it. You can use ref, you can use out. Again, you won't find too much need to do it, and I would highly recommend you try to find some other way to do this if you can, because it's just not as clear what's going on. It can be a little bit harder to debug. In this lesson, we learned about void methods and methods that return values. We created a constructor to initialize properties, and learn to pass arguments by value and by reference. Coming up next, inheritance makes it easy to reuse code.